All right, we're going to pray. I think we could use some prayer right now. We're going to focus in, and we are going to do the lesson, and then we're going to have a discussion time. Um, Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for summertime and uh, time off of school and time to be together as a youth group doing all sorts of fun things. We thank you that we have the means to do things and the freedom to do them, um, and that you've encouraged us not just to Uh, be alive and subsist, but to enjoy the good things that you've created and enjoy fellowship with one another. We thank you for your true word, that as we come together tonight, it's not just for fun, that it's also to be renewed and to be reshaped and to be brought closer to you. We pray that as we come to your word, you would be renewing us in our minds, but that you would also be shaping us in our hearts, in our desires, in all that we do to be more like Christ. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, friends. um, It's on the board. We are doing Calvinism 101, and it has been punctuated by gaps where we have been on various activities out of town and whatnot, and it's summertime, so we're going to do a little bit of review to catch ourselves back up to where we are today. Uh, Does anybody remember anything from the first couple of weeks? We started with the question, what is Calvinism? Does anybody have a response to that? The study of Calvin. That would be a weird religion. Yeah, it's a, it's a system of doctrine, a, a way of understanding the truths of Scripture. So uh, we would understand it as a system that comes from Scripture, but uh, that gives us a lens through which we can view the whole world. So it's a, a biblical system of understanding all sorts of things. So in, in some sense, it's really wide-reaching. And even in the scope of what we've talked about, uh, we haven't really touched a lot of the stuff that, that could be attributed to a Calvinist worldview. So we're just sort of brushing the surface of what is rather a large system. It is a worldview. What are some other ways of describing Calvinism? Yeah, it's about God's sovereignty. So if you were to boil down Calvinism to one phrase or one word or one ism, it would be big Godism. Um, that God is very great and that God is very good, that he is the ultimate good, that he is all-powerful, and that all things are working together towards his sovereign rule. So there's nothing out there that's outside of his control. That's the way that Calvinism sees it, uh, because we believe that's what the Bible teaches. So uh, it is a system. It can be boiled down to the essential uh, principle of God being great and good in sort of an extreme kind of a way, which is kind of what you want when you have a doctrine of God. And one more way of describing it is that it is uh, Reformation theology or Reformed theology. It is one of the main streams that came out of uh, the, the Protestant movement against the Roman Catholic Church, the protests against Roman Catholicism. So it's from this main stream, this Calvinist stream, this reform stream, that you're going to get most of the denominations that you know today. So as we talk about the, the first set of main sort of bullet points as we look at the beliefs in the Calvinist system, uh, what you're going to see is something that, at least downstream, was common to all the denominations that you're probably familiar with today here in America. And those main points are, yeah, the five points of, well, the five points of Calvinism we're going to get to eventually, but uh, the five solas of the Reformation, um, which is, sola is the Reformed way of saying alone or only, um, and those five are God's glory alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, grace alone, and faith alone. Last week, we talked a little bit about God's sovereignty and a little bit about God's glory alone. Does anybody remember anything about that? Was it last week? It seems like it's been more than a week. Yeah, so somebody else had a hand up? A a startling statistic. Um, Yeah, so we were talking about how uh, there is a story. There is one large overarching story of what's going on in the universe, in history, And it's not about us, at least not originally or centrally. It's about God and what he's doing. At the very center of that story is going to be Christ, God incarnate. And we are brought into that story. We have significance because we were created by God as image bearers of God. And then we were redeemed as Christians into the image of Christ. So we are given significance as contingent beings. We don't have main character significance because of ourselves, we have significance because of our union with the main character of everything. But it's important to remember that the universe is not about us, it's about God. And so going along with that principle of God being the one that it's all about, also the one who is 
in control of everything is the idea that all things are going to be directed towards the glory of God. So what is the glory of God? It's one of those Christianese words. We say it often. What is glory? Kind of. Yeah, to be worthy of praise, something to be recognized, epicness. Um, what did you say? God's essential aspects. Um, maybe more correctly, it's the emanation, the going forth, the splendor of God's essential aspects. So if you were to like really boil it down, if God's sovereignty in, in a simple sort of format is his greatness and his goodness, then his glory is that greatness and that goodness being expressed. So the Bible gives us the image of light, like the sun is emitting light and it's, it's bathing the earth and the solar system in that light. It also gives us the image of weight, like there's a, there's a heaviness to it, there's a heft, it has density. Um, it's, it's meaningful. If you have a conversation, you're like, heavy. Um, it had, it had a weight to it. It had meaning to it. His glory is what gives meaning to anything. His glory is what sheds light on anything. His goodness is what gives goodness its goodness. And so his glory is the emanation of his essential attributes, what it means to be God in the way that the Bible, uh, reveals him to us. So to glorify him is to participate in that is to be a willing participate, participant in his glory. All things are going to go to the glory of God, right? Because he is not just all good, but he's all great. So there's nothing that's going to like run away from what he's intending to do with it. It's, it's going to be moved to his glory. But as his people, we're given the role of participating. So when we say we're doing things to God's glory or we want to glorify God in what we're doing, what we're saying is that we are going along with the kingdom goals. We're becoming participants in his will. We're obeying not just his decreed will, what, what he said is for sure going to happen in history, but what he wants for us, uh, flourishing, blessedness, what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. What it looks like to be a Christian is to be a participant in God's glory, is, is shining it forth. I thought about this uh, when we were in doing VBS where every day it was, what, shine Jesus light. Um, <laughs> that was weak. Um, when things are good, shine, shine Jesus, Jesus light. light. Okay, they still got it. What you're doing is, yes, there's, a, there's an aspect of like being Christ-like, and there's an aspect of sharing God's love with other people, but there's also a sense in which, as image bearers, we represent and we reflect God. And when we, when we are properly representing and reflecting God, we are reflecting the light of God's glory out. We're, we're participating in it. We're becoming a, a conduit of his glory into the world because we are glorifying him. So, yeah, we talked about God's glory being the goal of all of existence. And so everything that happens ever is going to be directed to that aim because nothing that happens is outside of God's sovereign control. <clears throat> so we moved from sovereignty to God's glory alone. And this week I want to talk about all of the rest of the solas. Let's see if we can do it. And from there, we're going to take a slower time going through the doctrines of grace or the five points of Calvinism and some of the downstream things from that, like the P word predestination, uh, but also what sort of these uh, basic ideas of Calvinism have to do with the Christian walk and real life, there, there are more implications from Calvinism than just predestination, although that's the one that gets a lot of attention, right? So we're going to try to go through these pretty quickly, and we're going to get into that and go a little bit slower. Um, does anybody know where the five solas come from? Yeah. Bible is the, probably the best answer. Um, Luther came up with some of these. Where we see them like fully systematized, all five, is going to be coming from Calvin. So when we talked about the Reformation and the way that Martin Luther was the initiator and there were other guys who were also working in this, Calvin was a little bit later in the Reformation. There were guys that were pre-Protestant Reformation that were basically doing the groundwork. So Martin Luther, you know, sparked the fire, but there was embers burning already around guys like John Huss. Um, but Calvin is the guy who's systematizing it and kind of putting it all together in a digestible uh, and, and wide-reaching kind of a form. So we get these, and these are things that ought to be pretty uncontroversial amongst Christians. I haven't run across many Christians that are like, God is not sovereign, um, or things aren't to God's glory alone, um, like they should be to our glory also. 
or that Christ isn't important, or that scripture is not important, um, or grace or faith. So these are all things that, at least on the surface level, should be things that anybody who is a Protestant, anybody who is an evangelical, uh, anybody who really believes the Bible is going to be able to get on board with. It's understanding the, the full depth of these and what they mean in sort of a detailed kind of a way um, and, and the downstream effects of these where things start to get controversial and hairy. So we're going to get started. Um, we're actually going to start with Scripture alone. So does anybody know what the doctrine of Scripture alone is basically saying? I mean, it's kind of in the name, but there's a little bit more to it, right? So you're going to get your doctrines of Christianity from the Bible. That's part of it. Yeah. It's going to be the, the most authoritative book. True. So, um, yeah, it's the only set of writings that's God-breathed and inerrant and infallible. Um, what's the difference between inerrant and infallible? Do you guys remember? Do what? Let's, yeah, you go. Good. Yeah, inerrant does not have errors. Infallible cannot have errors. So it is true that it's inerrant, but it's also true that it's infallible. Why? Because it's God-breathed. It comes from God. Um, yeah, so this is the idea that it's, um, Scripture is going to be authoritative, I think, is the bottom line of Scripture alone. It's not that Scripture is the only thing that contains truth. It's not that nothing else is helpful, but Scripture is going to have the final authority. That's going to be the key. So, Lord of the Rings, you guys know how in the land of Rohan, there is a king named Theoden, and there's also a guy there hanging out, name of Grima Wormtongue. What has Wormtongue done to Theoden? Who knows? Poisoned him? In what way? <laughs> That'd be a weird superpower, wouldn't it? <laughs> That'd be like oddly powerful because they couldn't talk after that, and it would be unsettling to have a worm in your mouth. Um, yeah, he's he's whispering lies to him, but it's actually even more than that. He's the sort of the, the conduit or the, the instrument through which Saruman is taking control of the kingdom of Rohan. So Theoden is the rightful king. He's supposed to be in charge, but you've got Saruman who is really controlling things behind the scenes. And it gets so bad that Theoden is kind of like sitting there and he's artificially aged and he's under this spell. And you have Grima whispering things in his ear and then telling people what the king, other people what the king wants. So you're really getting any access to the king through Wormtongue, who is really working for Saruman. So who has the authority in the kingdom of Rohan at that juncture? <laughs> um, yeah, Saruman is the one that's going to have uh, final authority in that kingdom. So in any situation, in, in any worldview, you're going to end up with a final kind of authority. But if you have a situation like you have in Rohan, there might be a king still sitting on the throne of Rohan, but somebody else is wielding real practical power. Saruman's the one who's making the laws of the land. Saruman's the one who's making the final judgments about what's going to happen. So when Eomer comes and he's like, listen, Saruman's invading Rohan and he's killing people everywhere. We should probably do something about this. I'm ready to go. Saruman, through the king, tells him, stand down. In fact, you're banished. So it's Saruman who is writing the laws of the land and who's making judgments over what actually goes on in the kingdom. Now, this happens in the real world in sort of different kinds of ways. Uh, maybe a less dramatic form of this is in England. You have the king, the right now, used to be the queen. You have the monarchy, but they don't have any real power. They're what we call a figurehead, right? The, the real power is in parliament or maybe in corporations, who knows? Of course, nothing like that could happen in a country like ours with a democratically erect, elected leader. Um, it, it's not possible that somebody could be a figurehead kind of a president, but <laughs> I'm having trouble moving past it now. Um, <laughs> just keep going. All right, so <laughs> there's, a, there's a final authority in that kingdom, and it's going to be Saruman, not Theoden, even though he's on the throne. The situation of the Roman Catholic Church at the time of the Protestant Reformation was such that there was still a high view of Scripture, and in fact, even to today, to today, there is a high view of Scripture in the Roman Catholic Church. However, there is um, 
a, a distribution of authority such that the authority of Scripture is taken away. Does anybody know how that works? What else is given authority in the Roman Catholic system? The Pope? What else? Tradition. Um, in fact, the, the powers of the Pope kind of come through the powers of tradition. So a couple of things in, in the Roman Catholic system. One is the understanding or the belief that all of the books of the Bible were not recognized by the church, but were rather chosen by the church. So scripture itself is based on the authority of the church. And then it is also true in their system that tradition holds the same level of authority as scripture. The problem being that if at some juncture the church is essentially a political entity and it holds the same authority through uh, its interpretation of scripture and therefore its traditions of scripture as scripture and no one really has access to the scripture, then what you get is a system where scripture doesn't really have any true authority. It becomes a figurehead, kind of like Theoden under the sway of Saruman through Grima Wormtongue. Um, so it, it's not that the Roman Catholic Church had a low view of Scripture. It, it believes to this day that it's God-breathed, but Scripture doesn't get the final say. It doesn't get the final authority, and it really doesn't have the, the foundational power that it has in our understanding, which is really, we think, the biblical understanding, um, and that is the, the Protestant understanding as well as the, the Calvinist understanding. So turn over to Matthew chapter 15. Would somebody read chapter 15, verses 1? Anybody want to tell me what we just read? Scripture alone. Good summary. Good summary. What was going on? Tradition. Scripture alone. Why use many words when few words do trick? Yes. You're not wrong. Yes. Justifying sin using tradition. That's exactly what's going on here. So what you had in the first century Jewish community was very similar to what ended up happening in the Roman Catholic Church at the time of the Reformation that you had a group of people who were the ones interpreting scripture, developing an interpretation, and then kind of cutting off access to altering that interpretation, and then using their traditions on the same sort of level as the scriptures themselves. So what they were doing was saying, okay, there's a, there's a commandment that you're supposed to honor your father and mother, which means, especially at that time, taking care of them in their old age because there was no like fallback system. There were no safety nets. The government wasn't going to take care of them. Um, arguably, it is still your role today to take care of your elderly parents. I'm not saying that it's not. But especially back then, it was very, very important that people took care of their elderly. And it's a commandment, right? But what they were doing was saying you could basically use a tithing loophole and when your parents needed something from you and asked for it, you could just say, that's devoted to God. Sorry. Um, it, it's already sort of taken. And it was a loophole that was created through this structure of traditions that the Pharisees had set up. So people were not honoring their mother and father by doing something that actually appeared pious in terms of what their tradition was saying. Like, you were giving something to God, but they weren't actually offering it to God and for gratitude or worship or anything like that. They were doing it as like a tax loophole, essentially. Um, they were getting out of the old people tax, which is a bad name for a tax. So Jesus says, you hypocrites, you hypocrites. I'm pretty sure that's probably the right way to say that. I'm not going to, I'm just trying it out. I'm just trying it out. <laughs> he says, you hypocrites, because you're, you're, you're acting like you're pious, but what you're doing is obviously impious and is, is really actually violating the scripture itself. So in the, the Roman Catholic tradition, there were all sorts of things that were serving that function. They had moved away from the essentials of the gospel because they had undermined the authority of scripture. So scripture alone, the fact that scripture has final authority is what is known as the formal cause of the Reformation. We talked about this in the first week, that at the heart of it, the material cause, like 
what the Reformation consisted of was grace alone, because that is the issue of salvation. How is it that we are saved and that salvation is given to human people? And we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But the formal cause, what gives it its shape, this argument about being saved, is who has final authority to say how we know we're saved? Is it scripture or is it scripture and church tradition? And the Roman Catholic answer was scripture and church tradition, and you have to get your interpretation of scripture through the church. So there's your problem. Um, What the Reformation says, what Calvin says, what scripture itself says about itself is that it is the final authority. Um, turn over to Psalm 19. And would somebody go ahead and give me 2 Timothy 3, 14 through 17? Who's going to do that? Will? Um, somebody want to read uh, Psalm 19, 7 through 11? Who would do it? All right, okay, so you could go down that scripture and look at the end of every first sentence in the pairs. It's perfect, it's sure, it's right, it's pure, it's clean, it's true, it's like gold, it's like the honeycomb. This is a psalm that's talking about the law of the Lord, that is, the scriptures that existed at that time, the the word of God. It is perfect, it is clean, it is pure, it is desirable. It is useful for living life because it can make wise the simple. Um, And in the Old Testament, that's essentially, are you living life correctly or not? It's not just, are you a smart person or not? This is, are, are you a person who is living life as God designed it for human beings? Or are you doing something that is abhorrent to God? That is the dichotomy of the wise and the simple there. Um, it's, it's the path of wisdom or the path of the foolish. But it starts with perfection. There's an idea in this psalm that what you're dealing with when you're dealing with the law of God, that is scripture, the word of God, is that it is perfect. All right, give me Second Timothy. Okay, both of these passages are probably not foreign to you. In fact, you've probably heard them over and over again. But they're very, very important in terms of establishing the authority of Scripture. And we could go through hundreds of verses that set up all of the ways in which Scripture is perfect and it establishes its own authority. The way that Jesus has treated Scriptures in the one that we just looked at, he says, Scripture is on a different level than any teachings of man. So it's on a whole different level of authority, that is. The psalm says it is perfect. It is desirable. It is useful. Second Timothy, Paul is saying that it is actually breathed out by God. It is God's very word. It is, that's where we get inspired, is that breath, like expiration. It's, it's breathing it out. He has spoken the very words of the scripture. And that's why it's perfect. And that's why it's profitable is because the word of God, the words of God, they bear the attributes of God. Just like his glory emanates out from his essential nature, so do his words bear his essential nature. We kind of throw words everywhere, and some of them are meaningful, some of them are harmful. Um, We are not creatures that are the same as our word, but God is perfect and he is ultimate. He is great and he is good. And when he speaks, reality becomes reality. When he ordains something, that is when he says something is going to happen, it's as if it's already happened because it's that sure. So when he speaks and he has it recorded for his people, if scripture is the word of God and it says that it is, then it bears the same authority as God. And so there can't be anything above it. That's why Jesus says this has authority over anything that mankind is going to teach because it has this this ultimate kind of authority. And it's going to be self-referential in that authority. Nothing gives the word of God authority other than it being the word of God because that's sort of like base level reality, right? If this is truly the word of God, then we should be looking at it and seeing how can we profit from this? How can we understand it? How can we apply it to our lives? Yeah, yeah, good question. So 
if I'm understanding you, if all we need is scripture, then why are there so many different interpretations of scripture? Um, well, there weren't, there wasn't really for a long time because the church was sort of had uh, hemmed that in. Like you had to go through the church to get the proper interpretation. What the Reformation said was, what I think the word of God implies is that every Christian is given the freedom, the right, if you will, to come to the word of God and to find an interpretation. So not only does scripture say that it is sufficient, but it's also clear. Now, not clear in every way and in every part. What Sola Scriptura says is that uh, scripture is sufficient and clear for those things you need to understand in order to be saved. But scripture is not the same amount of clear in every part. So these basic truths, the, the essence of the gospel, should be available to anybody who has a basic understanding of the language that the Bible is written in and the world that we're living in. That's basically what it's saying, is that it's, it's clear in that. But there are parts of scripture that are not as clear, and there's a principle which we're not going to get way into, but is there, that it's not just the, the, the explicit teachings, but it's also the implicit teachings of scripture that bear the authority of God. So we are encouraged to reason from scripture. Um, but we're supposed to reason from scripture using scripture as the bounds of that reason and as the foundation of that reason. So that being said, if we're using clear parts of scripture to interpret unclear parts and we're reasoning from the scriptures for certain things, then there's going to be a certain amount of disagreement, but there should be a, a large amount of agreement on the central thing. Does that make sense? So, um, if something were true, and we all had access to it, you would expect there to be a certain amount of agreement and a wide range of disagreement ab about the smaller thing. So even if you look at science, for instance, there's generally a major uh, consensus on a certain issue that will change from time to time as more things, more information is discovered. And then there's going to be a fair amount of disagreement about a lot of the details. And that's where you're gonna get like the scientific denominations of some given issue. The thing is with science, what you keep getting is more information, and so your consensus is going to slowly move. With scripture, since the canon is closed, we have a set amount of information. Our understanding is that this book contains the, the full amount of revelation we're going to receive. The consensus shouldn't be moving, but you're still going to have some of those disagreements. I'd also say a lot of the disagreements end up coming about because you're not actually agreeing about the authority of the scripture itself. So if you look at a bunch of reformed churches that all agree in the authority of scripture, the sovereignty of God, there's going to be a huge amount of agreement. You could move that out to people who are basically agreeing on these main things, but not some of those downstream things or covenant theology. There's still gonna be a huge amount of agreement, small amount of disagreement where you get the real diaspora or the real spreading out of denominations is a lot of times the denomination will start slipping towards liberalism. They lose the uh, authority of scripture element and then all of their other doctrines go out the window, which is what happened to the Roman Catholic Church, except instead of um, sort of the liberalism we tend to see today, you get sort of a, uh, an organized kind of a liberalism where you're still taking the authority and you're giving it to mankind, but they had a centralized kind of authority, whereas we tend to be more decentralized ever since the Reformation in terms of Christian denominations. Does that make sense? Follow-up question? Other questions? Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's why we still need uh, people with expertise, especially in the ancient languages. A lot of this return to the basic truths of Scripture came from people actually assessing scripture itself. Like Martin Luther had access to scripture, which a lot of people didn't, and had the ability to understand it in a lot of its original languages, which was also not common. So um, a moving away from the Latin Vulgate, which was a Latin translation of the New Testament, uh, as well as people who were actually reading scripture and saying, okay, what the Roman Catholic Church is teaching does not agree with what scripture says, that's where you get a lot of the move to the Reformation. So you'll still need people with expertise. You still need people who spend a lot of time studying it. That's where we get like pastors and teachers um, is that like it's our vocation to study scripture and communicate it to people um, to try to understand these things. But this is one of the good roles that a, a good creed or a good confession will play 
is that what you have is an established consensus that's been systematized, an understanding of the breadth of Scripture. Um, so a lay person can come to Scripture, they can test the confession for themselves with Scripture, but they can kind of get a full system all at once that they can say, this seems to be generally true, I'm going to tease out the details as I go, uh, which is essentially what Calvinism is or Reformed theology is. If you take the Westminster Confession of Faith, it's a, a system of understanding what the Bible teaches, and you can kind of accept the system and then test it with Scripture. But if you go through the confession, uh, there are Scripture references all through it. There's, there's a sense in which you're in encouraged to test it, disagree with it, in order to find out if it's true. Any other questions or thoughts on that? Okay. So, Scripture as the Word of God, since God is communicating it to his people, like the reason God has spoken is in order to reveal his will to people. And that's what Scripture says it's doing. That's what Scripture is, is God speaking with his people. Just on that basis, we should expect it to be reasonably clear and sufficient to accomplish whatever purposes God has in trying to communicate with his people. So, if people are to be saved, if the gospel is the message of the Bible, then the gospel is going to be able to be understood. It's going to be communicated, and it's going to be faithfully transmitted down the generations to the people who need to hear it. Um, so coming out of Scripture as the Word of God is its sufficiency, is its clarity, is its authority. Um, okay, any other questions on Scripture alone? We're going to move on to grace, actually. We're not going to make it, guys. <laughs> we, can, we can do this. Um, just keep, we'll just keep going until the lock-in, keep going through the lock-in. So part of the problem with going through, like, what is Calvinism? What is Reformed theology? And hitting the solas is that there is so much downstream of this. There is a whole worldview out of this. There is every, 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 every implication for life and practice for the Christian. Um, there is everything about what God has been doing through history it's all going to be somehow connected to these. And so it's, it's difficult to sort of rein it in. But um, I'm glad we talked about that. Let's talk about Jesus, and we will close with that. Yeah, but like specific. All right, um, turn over to Colossians. And would somebody read Colossians 1, 15 through 23? Rachel. Yeah. Um, and just jump over with your eyes to Colossians 2. I'm going to read 1 through 15. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom all are hidden, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the firmness of your faith in Christ. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us, with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. So we basically just read half of Colossians. That was a long passage. But in the first passage that was read, we see who Christ is, right? This is a description of the one 
who is the center of the universe in a really kind of a significant way. He is the center of time. He is the center of God's love meeting mankind. He is, he is the bridge across the gap of our sin. He is the center of God's glorification of himself. We read uh, last week in Ephesians that God's glory is most manifest through what Christ accomplished, through what he is doing even now in the church. That's what does make us significance is that we're united to him because he is the center of everything. He's the center of our salvation and he ought to be the center of our lives. And Christ is what makes us Christians. It is distinctive. It is that there is no other way, no other truth, no other life, that there is really only one way to be made right with God. And the fact is that we all have a need, a hunger. There's something terribly wrong with the world. There's something terribly wrong with us, and it has to be made right. And what the Bible teaches is that it was made right in a very specific kind of a way through a very specific person. So we understand that God did two things through Jesus in terms of saving us, that Christ lived a perfect life and that gets imputed to us. What does imputed mean? Transferred, but like in the sense that it isn't rightly yours, but it is credited to you. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's like having somebody else's credit on your account. Like we all know that it doesn't belong to you, belong to you, but it is credited to you. Um, that's essentially what it means. And if you look at uh, chapter 2, verse 13, it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, by nailing it to the cross. So our sin, the sin of everyone who was ever saved in all of history, was nailed to the cross, was imputed to Christ. So The way Reformed theology understands this is that there is a double imputation. Our sin to Christ for no reason other than God's favor on us and his glory ultimately. And then Christ's perfect record imputed to us for no good reason other than God's favor and love for us and ultimately his glory. This is pretty radically different than the Roman Catholic view of how this operates. So for them, it is a righteousness that is infused in you, and you get, um, so you get this infusion when you're baptized. You basically get a clean record. You get a flashy new righteousness. But over time, since you are not perfect, you're going to damage that righteousness, and you're going to have to maintain it. The only way to maintain it is by gaining access to services that the church provides, like penance, um, like confession, like going to mass, So they believe you actually get your own righteousness that you then have to take care of and that your works are joined with the original grace that you got and may ultimately end up in your salvation if things work out according to plan, as it were. The biblical understanding, the the understanding that we just read, the Reformed Calvinist understanding, is that double imputation. Well, we get, we get not because of anything that we have done, or could ever do. And Christ takes the punishment for everything that we ever have or ever will do wrong. As soon as we are made right with God, we are justified before him. And it's not because of anything we did. And so there's nothing that we could do to take it away. There is a huge amount of freedom in that. And we'll get into it. We'll finish this up next week, talking about grace alone and faith alone, because there is more to that story. And then we're going to be moving through that into Uh, the doctrines of grace, the five points of Calvinism. The reason we're going through these things is because they're good and important and biblical things, but also because when you get to the distinctives of what sort of divides Calvinists, Reformed people from other denominations, when you get to like predestination and sort of the controversial things, we understand them as flowing directly from these basic biblical principles, from the gospel itself. So we see them as very, very important. Not that you have to believe them to be saved, but that to really understand the gospel in its fullness and to understand and live out the implications of it, to get the full riches of what it means to be saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, with that weight coming off of you, taking on his burden, which is easy, and him taking your burden. That has huge implications for our assurance of faith, for the way that We live our lives out of gratitude for the way that we share our faith with other people, for all sorts of things. 
So any questions about this so far? Anything we talked about? Anybody?